Well, hi everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this webinar about the Intelligent Investor Ethical Share Fund. I'm Tom Wilson, I'm one of the product specialists at Investmart, and I'm luckily joined today uh, by Nathan Bell, who's the portfolio manager for our Intelligent Investor Funds. Hi, Nathan, how are you doing? Morning, mate. It's uh, nice and sunny there in Sydney. It's definitely, we've been uh, having a bit of good weather here, as you uh, mentioned. In Melbourne. Yes, I attended a uh, microcap conference the past couple of days, uh, which reminded me of just how good the high quality businesses are because there was um, a lot of ways to lose your money there. Um, but amazingly, three awesome days of 2021 degrees, sunny weather, and just uh, after three years of La Nina in Sydney, of relentless rain and dark clouds, um, it was actually amazing how, how good it felt. Oh, that's really good. I'm sure we'll get some more of that towards the end of the year. but. I guess you'll also go through a lot of things today, talking about the uh, the new offer that's come out for the existing Intelligent Investor Ethical Share Fund, and that has the ticker code of INES, which you can probably see on your screens there. I'll just run through how this, this works. Um, we had some questions received when people were signing up for the webinar, which is fantastic, but you can also ask questions uh, that you know are relevant to the actual uh, ETF itself on the right hand side of the screen. We can't provide any personal financial advice, only general product advice, um, but we'll do our very best to get through the questions. So don't hold back. And there'll also be a recording of this webinar placed up on the website uh, on the product or on the offer page actually, and we will send an email to all of you as well. But uh, yeah, Nathan, uh, I'll let you go through everything and uh, the screen is all yours. Thanks, mate. Uh, we normally only do these once a year, uh, a secondary offer for each of our funds, but we weren't going to get a chance to do this one again until late next year, um, even though we've already done one for the, for the ethical fund earlier in the year. And so we thought it was better to do it now because by the time 12 months comes around, I think we may have gone through a period, hopefully, where we've scooped up a heap of bargains, invested all the cash, and with a bit of luck, um, the fund will be higher than what it is today, if not materially so. So uh, that's the reason why we'll be doing two this year and we'll be back to normal next year with just one each, one webinar each for the fund, one secondary offer. But I also thought it was a good time because it's been a while since uh, we've done a webinar and I've got in front of everyone and for people to ask questions because I, there's a lot going on at the moment. I'm sure people want to understand what our outlook is and what the changes we've made to the portfolio. So I just thought it was that good timing from that perspective. Uh, but that explains why we're, we're doing two in the same year, which, which won't happen again. So as usual, we're all care and no responsibility. Please don't take anything we say as personal advice. Uh, we will be uh, letting, uh, we always do uh, provide a copy of the, of the webinar and the slides. So I'm not gonna talk in detail to every slide in the presentation. I wanna leave plenty of room for questions, um, but it is always just worth going through uh, what we're looking for in this fund and, and generally, and we talk about the proven AI approach because it's been uh, you know, two decades now um, since Intelligent Investor has been around. Um, 2006, so I joined the business, so it's been a long time now. Uh, this fund's been around for three years and we've been managing money uh, since 2015 with the launch of our income fund and um, the model portfolios that um, sort of precede these funds um, have excellent track records and uh, th that's why we're more than happy to launch the funds and we really should have done it a lot earlier. This this fund in particular is really about high quality businesses and, and the reason is because it, it is an ethical fund, it has an ESG filter on it and basically what that means is that it rules out basically all the typical areas that you think are going to be ruled out. So armaments or fast food or you know, whatever you like, it's it's all that you know coal stocks where we've made a lot of money in our other funds recently. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel as far as the ESG filter is concerned. The only reason I agreed to launch this fund was because we went back and did the research on the nearly 500 buy recommendations that we'd had over the 20 odd years through our subscription service, and that included re-recommendations of the same stocks. So I wasn't 465 odd unique recommendations uh, in that sense. But it, it clearly showed that I think the average return from memory was about 14 and a half or 15% annualized return from the stocks that would have passed the ESG filter compared to 10.1% for the stocks that didn't pass the ESG filter. So it clearly showed that when we focused on quality rather than necessarily cheapness 
uh, and lower quality businesses that we did far better. So that's why I agreed to it. And the numbers so far, although the fund's only been going for three years, have bear that out. And it's actually, uh, I actually think it's a really exciting time for the fund because we've had, when we launched the fund, the market was pretty expensive. And we invested about 80% of the initial cash that we raised and we had 20% in cash. And then when the market fell because of COVID, we put that 20% to work very quickly and we had extraordinary returns. And I think at one stage, the fund might've been up around 33% or 34% ahead of the market in a fairly short space. And we'll talk about the performance in the moment, but since then, um, you know, the performance has been, over the past couple of years, it's just been around the index, which I actually think is a really good result. And I'll explain why in a moment. But if you have a look at the sort of businesses we're looking for now is these growth, high quality businesses with the founders running the businesses. That's a really important part of our investing process and only gets more important to me every year. And so the idea is that from time to time, these stocks will get cheap and they've still got long growth runways. And the best way to compound your money at high returns is to not have to sell those stocks. So it was a bit unfortunate last year that we had such a big distribution and for people that have to pay tax would, would have had to pay a bit of tax on that. But that was the price we had to pay for a bunch of takeovers in some of our biggest stocks. Uh, and also because we sold some stocks that became very expensive and uh, that's really allowed us to protect uh, uh, the portfolio on the way down more recently, even though um, it's funny to think how bad the headlines are and yet the, the Aussie market's only down about 12% from the peak. It's quite incredible, really. Mm, yeah, there definitely is a lot happening at the moment out there. And I'm sure um, there's actually even that uh, quarterly report that you can find on the uh, Ethical Share Fund product page. And I'll try and give a handout, but you've definitely run through a lot of the, uh, uh, I guess, like economic uh, situation then. So I'll just hand that out as well. Yeah, I don't normally comment a lot on the macro stuff unless it directly relates to the stocks we're invested in. And and normally, and particularly at the moment, the stocks that we own in this fund are typically ones that are somewhat economically immune or, or less economically sensitive you know, to higher interest rates or recessions. We really want to own companies that are in control of their own destinies. And uh, again, it's, it just sort of works that way that um, those businesses tend to have uh, inside owners running the business. And it doesn't mean you can just buy any stock with, in, with an insider mm -hmm. running the business or founder running the business. As anyone will tell you, that's owns Harvey Norman, where I think the stock price hasn't changed in about 20 years. Yeah. Um, but I think this is an important aspect. We've got the filter, but we're not just sitting there ticking boxes. If you look at this slide here, I wish I had an updated slide, um, but I'm going to keep using this one until I, a new one is produced because it only goes up to 2014. But it just shows in the US market, the S&P 500, just how big the outperformance was up until 2014 from 1990, which was a bit of an arbitrary starting point for companies that were founder led. And if you think about the stocks that have done the best since 2014, it's typically been those big technology stocks that are mostly founder led companies. So. As, as wild as that chart actually looks, like it's, it's not even covering, um, you know, most of actually what's happened over the last sort of six to eight years. So it's something that's not just uh, in particular industries, although I've just talked about technology stocks, the chart on the right hand side, it actually shows that it's across industry. So there's uh, less and less ways to have an advantage over the market as time goes on because technology is improving and they're more and more investors looking at stocks so that like you don't really have an informational advantage anymore. The advantages that you do have though is still thinking long term, buying these owner managed owner operated businesses um, you know, and owning them for the long term and being patient. You know, these are sort of behavioral aspects of investing rather than data driven aspects of a business because I think these days everyone knows what the good companies are. The question is can you be patient to wait to buy them at a good price and then can you hang on to them? This just quickly looks at the performance of the fund. Uh, obviously, it's been fantastic performance since we started the last couple of years. Uh, we've roughly just been in line with the index. But I just want to talk about, uh, I know as an investor, all you really care about is, is outperforming and you just look at that one number. But for when you're actually running these funds, it's, it's how you make the money that's really important. And to actually be basically in line with the market over the past couple of years uh, is actually really, I'm actually really, really pleased with it. And the reason is, is because the real sweet spot for this fund is the mid caps and smaller cap industrial businesses that can grow quickly for a, you know, a long time because they're still small and then they've got um, 
you know, long growth runways ahead of them. And over the last couple of years, uh, particularly more recently, the, the money that we've made in our other funds has really come from uh, coal stocks and oil stocks, which we, we can't own in this fund. And that's really been the only place to make any money. And the parts of the market that have been hit the hardest by far is the small cap and mid cap industrial stocks. If you have a look at the fund at the moment, I actually think it's the safest fund I've ever managed. And the goal over the next year or so is to make it the cheapest uh, and most potentially uh, have the most potential that we've had since we launched the fund a few years ago. So uh, the last couple of years, the performance might not be exciting, but to me, it actually is because uh, a number of our stocks have been hit really hard for reasons that I don't think are going to hold up in the long term. I think it's just short term thinking, which is which is very typical of the cycle we're going through. For anyone who's thinking we're going to get the next GFC, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think it's actually quite incredible that mortgage rates in the US are currently around 7%. But the interesting thing is that the interest rate transmission, uh, when interest rates are going up through the economy, is actually really slow compared to when rates are falling. It actually gets capitalised into asset markets very quickly because if you think about the banks lowering interest rates, then people take advantage, they borrow more money and they buy homes or get margin loans and buy stocks or, or whatever. But on the way up, it takes a minimum of three months in Australia, even if you're on a variable rate before you actually have to start paying the higher rates. And recently we've had about, I think the peak was 48% of mortgagees who had a fixed home loan rate. And they're starting to roll off now. There's, I think about two thirds of that rolls off by June 30 next year, and then the remaining third over the following year. So even though interest rates are going up, people aren't really feeling that yet in their hip pocket. And in America, they have a very different home loan system to us. They actually have, everyone has a fixed home loan. So they lock in a low rate like they have in the last couple of years of 2% or 2.2% or whatever it is. And that's it, they've got that for life. And, uh, and that applies uh, at least and while they're in the home they're in. So, so they haven't actually been hit by these skyrocketing interest rates in the US. And yet you're seeing all these sorts of problems in the starting to emerge, whether it's sovereign countries that are running out of foreign reserves because their foreign debts are exploding because their currencies are falling and they're getting hit by a massive increase in costs, uh, particularly for companies countries that are big importers of energy and food, which is there's a lot. So if you sort of use that as a background, I'm really happy with the performance of the fund that's been protected money well on the downside recently. Um, but that's not what I measure success in. Like, yes, it's great to be a value investor and say to everyone, look here, uh, we make good returns in the good times and we've protected people's money in the bad times, which is what people expect of a value investor. But there's plenty of stories you can go through talking to fund managers from past cycles that protected the money well when the market fell and then they forgot to buy the bargains and um, in the recovery. And I certainly don't want to be falling for that. And it's uh, even though we've got a bit of cash in the portfolio at the moment, um, I'm not sitting there targeting an amount of cash. I just think a little bit of patience over the next six to 12 months as earnings profit downgrades, um, which are just starting now, as they flow through, I think we're going to get some better prices than we are today. But there's probably a bunch of stocks also that have probably reached their bottom or somewhere around there. So uh, I'll talk about the stocks we've been buying recently, uh, but we're certainly not sitting here panicking. We're trying to get on the front foot, but we just need to be really patient because these this downturn we're in, if we can call that, because you can't call it a bear market in Australia, uh, it's a bit slower than what we got used to with COVID where we just had this really short, sharp shock. Uh, and even with the GFC, the, the market actually muddled along fairly well for a while and then it had this mass panic but it only lasted like a week or two before TARP was announced and then the market recovered really quickly. So you only had like a really two or three days to buy those rock bottom prices. So people aren't used to this sort of meandering death by a thousand cuts, if you like, um, sort mm. of environment we're in. It's, it's, it's very slow moving. And so we just have to bring patience and that's really what people are paying us for. Yeah, I guess it comes back to the whole ethos as well that uh, it, this is a long-term investment um, that like a lot of our investments that we offer are it's not like a you know a, a one year type investment uh the suggested time frame is actually five plus years so uh patience is definitely a part of that but also understanding the the time frame uh, as well there are some quotes that i really hate using in markets but uh, one that actually just comes to mind at the moment is investing is a marathon not a sprint um, mm, yeah, and it's true yeah. at the moment. It's, uh, it's interesting. We've actually made really good money on the other portfolios, 
from coal stocks, but it, like no one thought they were going to go anywhere near as well as what they have. Um, and that's really held up, I think, the Aussie market pretty well too, because we've got big mining resources exposure and, and the banks, which I think uh, across the board, or CBA particularly, is quite expensive. Uh, they've all held up and CSL is about 7 or 8% of the index as well. So we've got mm. all these sort of major parts of the market that have actually held up pretty well, but it doesn't mean they're bargains or that's where we should be investing. Uh, this fund's actually sort of had headwinds, if you like, in that respect, because of the small and, and mid-cap exposure. Uh, and we haven't really been in those, you know, the iron ore stocks or anything like that, because that's not what's going to drive this portfolio over the next 10 years. The, the stocks we own, we're, we're really happy with. And it's just about investing the tail now of the portfolio. And I'm going to talk in a minute about some of the recent changes I've made. I thought it just very quickly for anyone that's new to the fund, just talk about why the fund has performed as it has. And I talked about earlier about how we maintained our valuation discipline from launch and we carried that right through. So when we had the cash to invest in the COVID bear market, that worked out great. Um, we haven't had a lot of big mistakes. Or actually, we haven't had any major mistakes in the fund. That's not doesn't mean we haven't had any mistakes, but just any ones we've had have been small. And the material for the fund, uh, I've already talked about the importance of owning lead stocks to the portfolio. But the, the other thing I think we did really well last year was we got a couple of big takeovers for what were two, uh, I think actually at, at the time, we're at two largest positions in the fund was Sydney Airport and Unity Wireless. So they were good stock picks and mm. the market recognised that. Well, actually, the market didn't recognise that, but acquirers did and took them out. So um, so we're not targeting a high level of cash. We just You just can't replace Sydney Airport, um, you know, because of the valuation for a start. And also it's a monopoly asset and there just aren't many of those around. So that's why we've been patient with the cash. And we also sold a couple of other stocks at really great prices. And now, as I'll talk about in a moment, we're actually starting to buy back some of those stocks at prices much cheaper than what we sold them for, which is perfect. You know, it's it's you know, stereotypical value investing, sell high, buy low. So that high cash balance is really the reward for good stock picking and, and it's protected the portfolio nicely in a couple of years. And I actually think we're in the absolute perfect position um, for the next year or two. Um, there's no stress, we've got no performance anxiety. There are a lot of funds that invest like us that have been absolutely belted recently and that they won't, you know, be lucky to get back those ret returns that they lost in over the next five or six years. And, and you can just feel the pressure a lot of them are, are, are under from the investors. I know there's, I don't follow a lot of other fund managers because there's not a lot of other ones that I respect and manage money uh, with the sort of same investment framework that we do. Um, but there's a couple I follow and their investors, the performance has been so bad that their investors, despite making these massive returns in the, the bull market and everything, have actually questioned the, the processes by those investors and actually said, do they need to change? And we're in the complete opposite um, position and, and I'm really glad we are because if we had to held on to a few more stocks and ignored our valuation discipline, we would have actually made a bit more money on the way up. But um, interestingly, I think every stock that I sold from the portfolio uh, on valuation grounds, only one of them currently is above that price. And that's Macquarie Telecom, which is really illiquid. And so I didn't want to be hanging on for the, the last dollar there um, because it's just so hard to buy and sell that stock. So, uh, so I think that shows that, that sticking to your valuations is hard, but that discipline is really, really important. And that's really why the performance has been good and why we sit in such a comfortable position today where we're in a position now where we can let the market come to us. We, we don't need to force anything. We don't need to be impatient. Um, the opportunities are coming and they're going to get better over the next six months would be my guess. But in 12 months, I'm hoping I'm going to be talking to you about a portfolio in or a market in recovery and telling you all about the bargains we scooped up. But I'd much rather be telling you about the exciting times ahead now than telling people in 12 months time that, hey, you've missed out on 20% performance in the fund because we bought all these great stocks. Um, Absolutely. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yep, yep. So how will the fund keep performing? Uh, I think really the, what I'm saying at the moment is we've got to avoid locking in media ochre returns as interest rates increase. Uh, the, the full effect of these higher interest rates, I don't even think has really even begun to hit valuations. Uh, I, I think what it's hit so far is uh, it's just the most speculative stuff really. And we've seen, I guess, the hit, if you like, from um, higher interest rates in the sense of, of removing the risk um, the big risks that people are taking. So you've seen all these tech stocks that are down 60 or 70%, you know, in Australia, things like Points, Bet or Red, um, Red Bubble or even our own Frontier Digital. 
Um, but if you have a look in the US, there's um, huge um, technology companies that are down 60 or 70% and they're still trading on um, massive valuations, which is why if you look at similar episodes in the past, you see those stocks typically end up down 80 or 85% rather than the 60 or 65% that they've fallen so far. And it's because retail investors in particular are still buying the dip and no one's panicking. Most people are employed and there's no pressure on anyone's balance sheet or, or money at the moment because interest rates haven't had an effect yet. So that's all in front of us, which is why this, I keep saying this thing's happening very slowly, but that doesn't mean uh, you know, worse things are to happen, but it, it's not like we're sitting here waiting for a GFC because the banks are all in good shape around the world. They had their GFC moment, so I'm certainly not waiting for that. But the stocks that we really want to own and the stocks that really suit this ethical fund are still very highly priced because they are the, the best businesses on the market. So we've just got to be a little bit patient. Now, we will be investing very aggressively when the time comes and we only need the market to be cheap for five minutes um, to put that cash to work. And I know some people will probably look at the cash and go, geez, you've got 30% cash, you know, what are you expecting? Some sort of you know, huge crash. But the thing is to put 30% cash to work, we could do that in 15 minutes. Um, so it's, we really like the stocks we own, but we don't want to dilute that with stocks we're not really excited about. And I think we could actually invest that money today and we could say, look, we can get a 8%, maybe a 9% return with that cash. But to me, that's not good enough. And I think it's just unnecessary to lock in that somewhat low return when if we're just a bit more patient over the next six months or so, we'll be able to turn that 9% into potentially 12 or 13%. And, and all we have to do is bring a little bit of patience. Like it's actually pretty easy. We've, we've been through these cycles, you know, countless times before. And there's plenty of history to show what happens in uh, when you have these huge boom in growth stocks and everything else. And then when interest rates increase, it, it's not rocket science. Um, but it is, it's hard because especially if you've got poor performance, you're under all this pressure from your investors to fix the performance. And we're just not feeling any of that. Again, I, I keep saying it, but just, I really like the portfolio. It's, it's no stress running it. I think it's the safest portfolio I've ever ma managed. And now it's just about letting the market come to us. Uh, so we had that really good M&A activity that worked out well for us. I think RPM Global is probably one that will end up getting taken out. Um, other stocks that are in a similar area are getting taken out for two to three times what that share price is worth at the moment. So that's why it's one of our biggest holdings. Um, and I think just that last one is really just, just recognise that, that, that the days of free money are over, at least for the moment, uh, and which re really should actually suit an active value approach. The fact that we run a value approach and we've actually still done so well in recent years where it's been really hard to keep up with the, with the markets that's just sent you know, the, the worst and most riskiest companies up to extreme prices. And to actually have done well through that period, I just think speaks volumes. And again, really happy with that. So just quickly, I've talked about a few of these things, but I'll just go through them. Uh, I think it's probably what most people are interested in, in at the moment. You know, what is the environment we're either in or we're we heading into? And I think the most, one of the most important things for me is in Australia, we we are just looking at Australian stocks and we're seeing the RBA not push interest rates up as hard as the US. But you need to be careful with just judging Australia by Australian standards. And the reason I say that is because the US remains the centre of the financial universe. And if you think about the GFC, we actually didn't really have a GFC in Australia. Um, but, but on the stock market, it looked like and felt like we did. The, the stock market got hit really, really hard. Um, but the GFC was really a, a US and a European thing. You know, our housing market held up and China bought all our resources. So we were cushioned by all those things and um, you know, employment stayed high and we've got through it fairly easily, but um, it was pretty painful for investors. It was um, you know, pretty stressful watching US banks go, go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, but just because we're not pushing interest rates up as high here or maybe um, you know, employment stays very high, doesn't necessarily mean that you should be paying over the odds for valuations because uh, interest rates going up in the US means interest rates going up for everyone or at least tighter liquidity markets, tighter credit market, markets, slower credit growth for everybody. It just makes life harder for, for everyone and that I don't see um, that changing anytime soon. So I'm uh, particularly focused on what's happening in the US um, just to make sure we've got a bit of a guide as to what to expect in Australia because I feel like we're three to six months behind what's going on there. Uh, even though if you actually look at the current numbers, everything's actually trick, ticking along pretty well, but we know that high employment numbers are, are typically a lagging indicator of future economic activity. And there are other things like um, commodity prices or 
prices for shipping, uh, all these sort of things that are a bit more leading indicators of future activity, which have, have all rolled over and are heading south pretty quickly. Obviously, we know inflation and interest rates are increasing. And I think people have, you know, if I read most things in the media at the moment, it's everyone is trying to pick the bottom and tell people that, you know, in the next six months, we're going to hit the bottom and then we're going to be turning around into the next bull market and, you know, life will go back to normal. But I think there are a lot of reasons why the future is not going to be um, at least normal as far as the last 10 years are concerned. I think it's going to be more normal of lower growth, higher costs, um, not not rampant credit growth and increasing asset prices. It's just going to be a, a more staid and, and what I think is just a more normal and hopefully a more sustainable economic backdrop. So uh, I'm not think, sitting here thinking we're going to have a GFC and then buy all these stocks at 10% of what they're worth and make 10 times our money. I, I think it's going to be more muted than that. Um, but that said, we've been buying some stocks and I'll talk about those at the moment. Still a long way, I think, for valuations for tech stocks to fall. And that has a bit of an impact on Aussie tech stocks as well. We don't have as many of them. And so they tend to get a higher pricing than what they probably get elsewhere. Uh, although that hasn't been the case for Frontier Digital Ventures, um, which I will actually talk about in the moment, because I think it's just a good example of the value that currently exists in the fund. And, and even if um, I don't want to test this theory, um, but even if the market were to go up and go back to crazy prices again, I actually think the fund would hold its own anyway. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not going to test that theory. We want to put that cash to work <laughs> as soon as we can. Yep. Uh, so I've talked about the small and mid-sized stocks being hit the hardest. Um, Frontier is a good example of that. We're seeing valuation multiples and profit margins compress very slowly. The analysts out there and the brokers, you're seeing them starting to reduce their uh, share prices for a lot of stocks. Uh, I've seen a crazy one for ARB, which is one of the most predictable and businesses on the market. And they they changed their valuation, I think, from $59 to to um, 35 or something like that. It was just um, crazy. And it, and it just shows you how we all sort of fall along and um, you know, we get, we get caught up in the momentum and it's really hard to pull yourself out of that. But I, I, that's why you have a team of investors and, and and I think we've done a really good job to do that. But that's not to say just because multiples have come down. I mean, not that we can buy Domino's Pizza for, for this fund, but it's trading around a bit under $60, was $50 a few days ago. Um, you know, that's down from $160 now. Uh, you know, we've got that as a buy in our subscription business, but just because something has fallen that far, it doesn't make it cheap. You know, Domino still trades on a very lofty multiple, but it just gives you an idea of just how crazy the bull market was. Uh, and for, for all the, the dominoes I can talk about in Australia, and there's a few, if you go to the US and particularly on the NASDAQ and to see some of the stocks just crazy. I mean, PayPal, um, I think had a higher valuation than MasterCard or, or Visa, one of them. Um, you know, just, just things like these amazing anomalies and um, Zillow is, a, is like the REA group of the US and nowhere near as good a business and it's had its own problems. But this was a stock that was over $200 about 12, 15 months ago and now it's like $26. Um, you know, now some people are still staying away from it. So it shows that it hasn't been painless, but I think what's quite remarkable is just how orderly the falls have been. You know, you look at all the headlines and all the bad things that are happening and just how fast and these interest rate increases have happened in the US and you just think there'd be absolute panic and things going wrong everywhere. But it's actually been somewhat orderly, although the UK is doing its best to, to buck that trend. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> in terms of getting through this next period and what we really want to own though, is just we really want to focus on those market leaders because they're the ones that actually benefit the most from the downturn. So for all the talk of the stocks to buy, you know, during a recession or a downturn or that benefit from inflation or at least can hold the value of their businesses by putting up prices, the market leaders are the ones you really want to own because they're generally the ones that come out of recessions with more market share in a much better shape uh, than their competitors. And that's really what drives profits over the next decade ahead. And that's what makes them far more profitable and far more valuable businesses in the future. You don't actually normally see that in the during the recession while you're going through it. And that's why you have to um, really follow the steps and the strategy that management is undertaking during those times because like a good example is a lot of companies will be have debt problems, they'll be cutting staff, they'll be doing everything they can to cut costs and preserve profits. So they don't have to worry about borrowing more money or going out of business. And the good businesses, they already have the safe balance sheets and they've got the money to keep investing, to keep hiring the great staff, um, you know, to keep marketing spend up and keep increasing their market share and keep looking after clients. And that's why they're the great businesses. And 
as I said at the start of the webinar, it was just the first thing I thought of when I saw a few of these stocks at the micro cap conference was it just reminded me of just how good the great businesses are and just mm. why you want to own them over the long term. So I thought I'd just uh, talk very quickly about uh, some portfolio activity uh, recently. So we sold Lendlease, which was uh, a four or five percent position across all our funds. This was a business that had been hit very hard by COVID. And, and there's a case, and I, and I still actually believe the case is, the profits are going to increase uh, in the next in the future as a lot of the massive developments, property developments around the world that the company is completing. Uh, once they get done, I think profits and dividends will increase. But on the flip side, higher interest rates are obviously like kryptonite for property businesses, has a big exposure to the UK, which is really in the doldrums now and has got some real severe economic problems. You know, inflation there is, um, I think it hit 10% the other day, which it hasn't hit since the 70s. Uh, and clearly no one's really in control of what's going on in the economy or in the government there at the moment. So it's, it's not a great place to be. But also Lendlease has very thin margins at the best of times. And it's still on the hook for the Metro tunnel. And with staff costs blowing out and delays on these types of big projects around the world at the moment, there, I think there's a real risk that we could end up actually having another capital raising for this business, which I didn't want to be a part of. And also there's some more information came around about their company's attitude towards a potential tax liability. And I've privy to some more information that's come out recently on that. And so I'm very happy with sold that business, even though it still looks quite cheap. And so that's another reason why the cash has gone up recently. So I think the governance is an issue there. I thought the culture might be changing under the new CEO, but I think what it's probably showing is just how hard it is to change the culture in a business, and particularly one as large and as widespread as Lendley's. Mm. Another one that we've actually kept, which has probably been the first stock we've had, was had a real ESG issue surrounding it, and that's Ansel. So this is the, the glove manufacturer. Uh, the company actually lost a Queensland Health client about uh, two months ago and they cited issues with the supply of gloves from uh, Malaysian uh, industrial gloves manufacturers, which is uh, one of the areas that is a big supplier to the world. And the, the main issue there has been labour, so just very poor treatment of labour, making them work seven days a week where they house them. Um, even stories of taking their passports off these these low paid workers, all these types of things. So, so I thought this was a really good test of of our business process because our um, filter that we use actually says that look, Ansel still passes, and you know I don't get to choose what passes the filter. It's just my job to for the stocks that pass the filter to make sure it's right because sometimes the filter doesn't get the business um, correct, particularly a business that has multiple divisions. So we still have to make, you know, give it the sniff test, if you like, um, to make sure it passes and, and the system's working okay. So Ansel still passes, so that's fine. But it's the way that the company has handled the situation that has been most important to me. And it would be very easy for Ansel, because it's actually a very small part of the business. It would be very easy for Ansel just to say, look, you know, we're not gonna let you supply gloves anymore. We're cutting the relationship and be done with it and then go and tell the, the media and investors, look, we've cut them off and uh, we're not dealing with them anymore. And you go, okay, yeah, that's great. I can tick my ESG box. And that's actually not really what you want. What you want is what Ansel's attitude is that actually we're gonna first, before we eradicate the supplier is try and go and fix the problems. And so what Ansel has done is that first of all, it's actually set up a, an organization with a bunch of other similar companies in the industry um, to deal with these issues um, together, uh, they used to be part of a government uh, body and they didn't think that was working. So they, they took it on their own to, to go and put this business, this body together. So I thought that was great. You know, obviously I can't be there to go and check that it's working, but um, you know, everything they're saying is the right thing. And so they've had success in trying to fix some of the, at least some of these problems. And they're putting even more plans together to, to, you know, to eradicate these problems altogether. So I thought that was really great. And I thought the second thing they did really well was they produced their sustainability report. And you know, most every company should really be doing this now, but they're not. They're not all of them are. And um, some of them for obvious reasons because they're just never going to tick those ESG box boxes. So for them, I think it's like why, why worry about it? Mm. But the other thing was they they actually had three of their senior executives. Uh, get on a webinar just like I am now and talk to investors and answer questions and go through the sustainability report. So 
I highly recommend, um, you know, if you are interested in sort of how some of these uh, ethical dilemmas are being dealt with, uh, I thought that was a really good example of it because it's, a, it's an active case, it's, it's live time, and it's a company that's actually trying to do something about it, which is actually what you want. You know, all we're doing is actually just applying a negative screen. We're not an ethical investor who's actually trying to do good, if you like. There are some funds out there that are actually trying to be very positive. And you know, obviously they've got a lot more resource and a lot more staff than we have to, to, in order to be able to do that. And that's great because that's actually what you really want from this ethical. It's not just necessarily avoiding the risk because we can do that with any portfolio. And we obviously already look at ESG risks as part of our investment process and all our funds. But actually what you want is these problems getting solved and so I thought that was a really good example of it and I'd highly recommend anyone to, uh, if they are interested, to go and read the sustainability report and, and watch that webinar. I'm, I'm sure it's on their website somewhere. The other thing is too, um, we're getting a lot of questions about the uh, ESG filter, the screening process, um, our approach. There's a link that I've posted in the chat for this webinar, but it's also on the uh, Ethical Share Fund product page that talks about that um, ESG, so environmental, social governance filter, uh, just doesn't focus purely on environmental. Uh, that's one thing a lot of people tend to think that ethical is all about, but there's a screening document and it literally will take you through it and there's a link inside at the very end that takes you to even further information, but I'm sure we'll touch on that as well. I just realised I've been talking for longer than I planned, but I just wanted to just go through What's happening at Frontier at the moment, just quickly, because it's a, a stock that's been hit pretty hard, and I think it's probably lumped into the um, non-profitable tech stocks, even though that's not the case. But I just want to give you an example of the potential there. It's it's going to take years to play out, um, but at the moment it, it feels like stocks are still quite expensive, or at least the ones we want to own. And then there are some stocks that are just genuinely very cheap, no matter how how you slice it. And I, I know people have been following me for a while now, probably tired of hearing about Frontier and would like to hear about some other stocks. And I um, actually had a slide there just before, um, which I, and you can see there, just in the middle there, there's a whole bunch of stocks that um, we've bought over the last little while. So I'm happy to talk about any of those, but um, they're almost um, mostly founder-led companies, all very high quality, all leaders in their businesses. And they're the ones that uh, I really want to, emerge from this sort of next this downturn if you like with high large positions in basically all of them um, but i won't go into any of them in detail but i just quickly want to say about frontier so the worry about frontier at the moment is it's investment in zameen which is the pakistan version of rea group and uh, the business is flying on the fundamentals it's flying the the problem is that um, people are worried that the pakistan currency is going to collapse and it's a good example of value investing and then sort of combined with growth investing, if you like, because last week the company announced that it's made some changes to its Latin American business. And what they're aiming for is uh, the business currently produces $30 million US of revenue annually, and they're aiming to get that to $100 million. Now, if it does that, now let's just, by way of example, let's just assume it gets there. Then they said they want to look at uh, a NASDAQ listing for that part of the business, so that's essentially spin it off. So that business alone, let's say it got to the US $100 million, uh, make some rough guess about the currency. You know, let's say it's traded on 10 times revenue. The reason they want to list that business in the US is because US investors really understand and like and are prepared to pay a premium for the growth in Latin American markets in a way that we don't in Australia. In Australia, we tend to put a premium on stocks um, or companies with growth in Asia. Um, even though I think that's quite dangerous, particularly for Chinese exposure. But nonetheless, that, that's the reason for that they want to look at doing a NASDAQ listing, but obviously it's, the business is not big enough yet. But let's say that that um, exchange rate was something where it is now, and the US, the US Aussie I'm saying here, um, and it got a 10 times revenue multiple, which is about average for these sort of businesses, then that business alone would be worth one and a half billion Australian dollars. Now, Frontier's current market cap is only about $280 million. Mm -hmm. It's got about $30 million of cash on the balance sheet. And if the Pakistan currency doesn't collapse, then its Pakistan business is probably worth $300 billion Australian, sorry, $300 million Australian as well. So you're talking about a business here that if the Pakistan business doesn't get smashed by the currency, um, just these two businesses alone are worth over $2 billion, which is potentially about seven times what the current share price is. So that's the sort of potential in this stock. And now it's going to take time to play out. 
Um, but even if the Pakistan currency collapses, basically at the moment, the market's already written off that investment. They've already priced it to basically zero. So even if the Latin American business even doesn't go that well, that's still worth way more than Frontier alone. So that's just an example of the sort of value you can find in the smaller end of the market. But I just reiterate, um, which I sort of tell people in these funds that we have, it is an all cap fund. There's only a certain amount of small caps we can own. So don't think you're buying into a small cap fund. It's just an area of the market which we can you can really drive great returns over long periods if you find the right small cap that can become a large business over time. And recently I've actually cleaned out um, some of the small liquid, uh, small holdings we've had in a bunch of shares um, because they're clogging up the small cap space. In, uh, I tell people that we have about 20% room uh, for stocks with a market cap of less than $500 million, which is one of the rules that we have to abide by as ASX listed actively managed ETFs. But it's actually less than that because sometimes a stock like Infratil, which is like a six or $7 billion business, most of its shares get traded in New Zealand, not in Australia. And therefore, because not many shares trade, it shows up in our liquidity rules as well. And so I, I sold that recently, even though I like the business, because now we're starting to see some of our mid cap stocks with their share prices falling, starting to fall back into that small cap uh, area. And I really want to keep that as clean as possible because there are a bunch of stocks and um, some we own already that I want to beef up over the next year. And I'm sure there's going to be another one or two new stocks I want to put in there. And because they're so important to the outperformance of the fund over time, you know, I don't want to clogged up with stocks that I'm not all that excited about. So that's why the cash is actually a bit, a bit higher than what it otherwise would be. I think if you took Lendlease out and you took those, I think there's four stocks I sold, uh, out as well, then the cash would um, be back somewhere down like 24%. So, um, so don't think we're sitting here holding this cash thinking there's a big accident in the head. It's more about just being patient for the earnings downgrades to come through. So I think that's enough of me, Tom, and uh, let's try and squeeze some questions in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess straight off the bat, given that the word, uh, you know, uh, ethics or ethical is uh, featured quite heavily in the fund, is there, um, like I've posted some information for uh, viewers, but is there a way that you wanted to quickly just run through how that works, the negative screening, um, who, you know, who we use um, and, and things like that? Yeah, so it, it's really simple. Uh, we just use a negative screen um, and we get it out of the Reuters system. So it's very easy. It's, it's automatic. The, you know, we're not sitting there making any judgments on the, the ESG criteria. What we did, as I spoke about earlier, was we took the ESG screen, which is just a standard screen, like it's another company doing the research and coming up with these ratings. And I went and applied that screen to all of the buy recommendations we'd ever had and to see how we would have performed uh, under those ESG criteria. And as I said, like a 15% return average for those stocks um, even surprised me. So it showed me that mm. we could actually run a, uh, we could outperform under the ESG criteria. but we're not actively you know, trying to bring any value to the actual ESG screen. All we're doing is applying our same long-term focus on high quality compounding stocks run by owner managers you know, to the ESG screen. And that's the only reason I was happy to, to, to launch it. Um, but, but we're not sitting here like a you know, many multi-billion dollar fund manager who's uh, got a team of eight people um, speaking to management about how many women are on the board or, um, you know, any sort of staff issues or um, independent numbers of board members and how they're going to get more women on the board or you know, whatever those sort of micro issues are, which are, are all important, obviously, but you know, we simply we don't have the time for it. I, I wouldn't have any time to invest if I was trying to do that on my own. Um, yet alone yeah. run the subscription business and manage our other funds as well. But the fact that our performance has been good so far, it shows you that staying away from ESG risks and just buying good quality businesses and hanging on to them works. It, it's really that simple. Yep. Yeah. So that def that's a, a good way to answer that approach. And um, those are updated weekly. I was reading uh, by Refinitiv, which is part of the Reuters uh, company. Um, so that's constantly kept up to date for us. Yep. So There's... we have Evan looking at that for me. I'm sure he gets sick of my emails. Yeah, because Evan Lucas looks after the uh, ethical growth portfolio in the InvestSmart professionally managed account. So I know I've had a few webinars with him in the past where he goes into a lot of detail uh, about those two. 
I'll just have a quick look at um, some other questions and definitely uh, feel free to pop them in the right hand side uh, of the chat of the webinar screen. Um, there's a, a few questions in terms of um, you know how you go through choosing the stocks um, and I know we've touched on this in previous webinars where you've got a dragon dens type approach. Um, is that the reason why we don't see companies like uh, you know much retail in this particular fund or is it due to the ethical screening? Um, you know would FMG ever squeeze in here because although a lot of people think about it being an unethical company in terms of digging up stuff out of the ground, um, it actually has a lot of really good impacts and scores highly on the, the social um, criteria of uh, ESG in the, in the sense that it hires a lot of Indigenous Australians and it puts a lot of money back into communities. Yeah, the good thing about our investment process is because they're very specific type of businesses that we're looking for and there aren't many of them in Australia, it tends to actually get rid of any ethical concerns for basically every stock. <laughs> uh, it's very yeah. rare we have an ethical consideration for the stocks we're trying to buy in, in any of our funds, um, but specifically for, for this ethical fund. Um, you know, would we include FMG? Like, um, I think people think I'm balking <laughs> at the question when I give this response, but the fact is we're looking for high quality industrial businesses and FMG doesn't really fit that. So I don't really have to think about it, but if it ticked all the ESG criteria, um, then I have to consider it because that, that's our mandate. Um, and then I have to decide whether it ticks all the other boxes um, in terms of you know management and fundamentals and valuation, all that, that type of stuff. Um, mm. But the one thing I'd say, one thing is really difficult, I think, about the shift to green energy. And this is why the government is really the main player to me, is because it's just so capital intensive to create these businesses. So what I mean by that is just really expensive. It takes a lot of money. And I'm sure everyone now, or at least investors can probably pick one or two green type companies that are maybe making some money. But there are a lot of them, most of them aren't. And most of them are very early stage businesses. And they're just not the sort of businesses that fit our fundamental criteria. And to give you an example, like one of the areas where cost has come down massively, which a lot of people probably have uh, experienced firsthand is the cost of solar panels. So there are a lot mm. of uh, solar panel manufacturers that went bust actually for quite a long time now, probably seven years ago now, seems like an eternity. The, um, and the reason was, it was just because the cost came down and you know, that didn't make any money. So um, they got destroyed. And so that's what you have to be really careful about. These are new businesses and they're very, it's very hard to work out who's actually gonna make money at all, yet alone, actually going to get a good return on their investment. And that's what we're really looking for in our, biz in our businesses that we own is what sort of returns can they get from reinvesting their profits? Um, you know, and to do that, they obviously have to be profitable to start with, but they also have to be pretty predictable. Businesses have strong competitive advantages and all, all those fundamental things we look for. But um, I may not have this statistic right because it's been a while since I looked at it, but I, I think it's something like for most companies, 70% of the value of the business over the next decade comes from how they invest their profits. Uh, so if you sit there and actually work through that, it's quite an amazing um, thing to think about. So to, to be able to do that, you actually, as I said, you have to have profits to, um, have to be profitable to start with, but you also have to look at the business and go, okay, where can they actually invest that money to make high returns? And that's why with banks, for example, they pay out most of their cash or profits as dividends because there's actually nothing else they can invest in. And, and the last thing you want is, you know, the latest transform, transformational acquisition, debt fueled mm. acquisition that um, you see from what I call the commercial CEOs, which are the usually the guys that are there for about five years and it's heads they win, tails you lose uh, because they've got all these bonuses tied to some big increase in the share price and they know they're not going to lose if they just go for it. So they do something very aggressive and risky and if it doesn't work out, then they just get sacked, take their salary with them and go on to, do, to the next thing. And we're looking for the absolute opposite of that. Yeah, and I think in a previous webinar, we've spoken about that. And uh, I've always liked your reasoning behind it is that you could probably do a better uh, you know, investment or decision making if they paid the dividends to you instead, instead of trying to put them into those transformational businesses like banks overseas in Japan or banks in the UK, for example. It's absolutely spot on. And I always use the discipline of Brian McNamee 
uh, at CSL who was actually getting treated for testicular cancer when he made an acquisition, I think, for a business called Telecris, uh, which was a US uh, blood business. And um, that, they, same style as CSL and the US government um, said, look, we're not going to let you have it um, because you'll have too much market concentration. And um, McNamee had already raised $2 billion for, of, from shareholders to make the acquisition. And most, you see this all the time, you see CEO does this and then the acquisition doesn't go ahead and then says, uh, you know what, we'll just hang on to that money and we'll find something sensible to do with it. And really that's just your typical empire building, it's just the management trying to increase the size of the business so they can increase the amount of money that goes into their pockets. And um, what McNamee did was he actually returned all that cash uh, as a share buyback. Um, so, so they're the sort of managers we want to want to be investing your money in. There's a, a few questions that we always get about um, what the actual ETF is holding and there's two places where we do publish this. One is of course the ASX, um, we have to make announcements at the end of every month. Um, what I'll quickly do is I'll just post the announcements page along with the most recent uh, announcement to the market uh, in the chat box here. But we also uh, have a model portfolio page. So if you're a subscriber to Intelligent Investor, uh, you can also see another page on the website, which I'll post as well. Um, but we do uh, have to announce this to the, the market at the end of uh, every month. Um, I'll just see this other question in the meantime, whilst I'm uh, posting this up. Uh, let's have a look. Um, if there are any further takeovers, Nathan, such as RUL, how much cash can you hold for the reinvestment versus the requirement to distribute the um, the profits um, in the form of capital gains and also uh, income to the investors? Yes, it's a great question. So we had this uh, really big distribution across all our funds um, earlier this year. And uh, I think I had cognitive dissonance where I was I was like, you know, we've, we've made the money, so that, that's absolutely great. Like, it's a good problem to have. And yes, uh, we're going to have to give this money back to shareholders because um, the way the funds work is you have to give all dividends and capital gains back to investors. And, and I thought, you know, it's, it's not ideal. We, like, people want us to compound their money in a tax-effective way, so most people don't really want that cash back. And, and then I actually, I just don't think I was really thinking, and then it occurred to me, oh, we've actually got to, Pay that cash out of the portfolios. Mm. Um, so then, so then the it was okay at the time. It wasn't an issue. It was like we had plenty of cash to pay it. But I think I just had this mental dissonance where I was just hadn't quite put together that the cash actually comes out of the portfolio. So um, I think that answers the question that uh, if things are taken over or we sell these businesses, uh, you know, at, at a profit, obviously, um, whatever that profit is does get paid out. So it's um, maybe some people are happy with that. Or I think most people are probably be annoyed at that because um, they don't have to pay the tax even though there's a, a lot of investors these days that um, are in a non-tax paying situation which is great and I look forward to being there one day um, <laughs> but it, it, is a part, it is a part of our funds where we do have to pay that stuff out and and the thing was as I said like the two of the takeovers I think there was a couple more but two of the takeovers were our biggest positions at the time I think like Sydney Airport might have even been five or six yep. percent when the acquisition was done so it became like a seven percent um, I don't think it got to eight percent position, um, and Unity was something similar. I think that was like a five, maybe even a six percent position at the takeover price. So these were really chunky distributions, and um, you know I don't. That's not going to be the case. So it was really only because we were so deep into a bull market, so you shouldn't expect them again. Um, although we've got these big gains on our coal stocks and our other two funds, so I expect that's going to be a big distribution at some point too. But hopefully we get a bit more of the money back through massive fully frank dividends, um, which would be more ideal. But you're always trying to balance um, the risk of, you know, we're sort of long, we are long-term investors and we want to hang on to these great businesses. But there are some times where we feel like they're becoming too risky because the market sent their prices up too far. So you want to be a long-term investor and keep the compounding going and not create capital gains tax events for our investors, but then you're running the valuation risk. And the last thing you want to do is hang on to those stocks for too long and, and all of a sudden the share price gets cut in half and takes care of your capital tax problem as long and takes your profits with it. So mm. um, we, we balance it as best, as best we can, but we really just focus on the investment process 
uh, and stick to the valuation that tends to work out over time. Are there any more uh, slides that you wanted to cover off? I can quickly run through just some of the admin uh, very quickly, some of the questions that I've got here I could uh, knock on the head. And just remember, if you do uh, hold or you end up holding the um, this ETF or any of our ETFs, you can always turn on dividend reinvestment. So take part of the dividend reinvestment plan. So as Nathan was mentioning, there was a large uh, distribution made. And if you have that turned on, it gets reinvested back into the fund. You don't pay brokerage. Um, just a reminder that this is um, the same fund that we've had since the beginning, the uh, INES, the Intelligent Investor Ethical Share Fund. It trades on the ASX with that ticker code. So what we're doing with these offers, so this is the, the latest, the, the new offer we've got where we can offer units directly through to you and you don't have to pay brokerage or there's no uh, buy-sell spread. Um, it's actually um, a fund that when we add units to it uh, or even have to take them away, it won't affect, affect the actual value of the fund itself. So when we see the fund trading, um, it has a net asset value uh, price per unit and it's not designed to trade at a premium or at a discount. So it'll stay exactly or as close as possible. And we have a liquidity provider that, that does that. Um, a lot of the information is on the offer page and also on the product page as well. Um, I guess I'm sort of running through some of the points that you've got here uh, already on the, the screen as well. Um, there's, uh, yeah, there's, if you want to, yeah. mm. Sorry, Tom, there's uh, one I, I added to this slide, uh, which is, I think it's really important. I think it causes a little bit of confusion sometimes, and that's the liquidity of the fund. And people see that sometimes, or most of the time, there's not much trading of the fund on the ASX. And people have interpreted that as the fund itself is actually not very liquid. And that's, that's actually the complete opposite. It's uh, the lack of liquidity, like the liquidity on the ASX, all that, all that shows you is the supply uh, and demand for the uh, interest in the fund. But the actual liquidity of the fund is extremely high. Uh, I talked about how we're forced to uh, follow the ASX guidelines for liquidity, and um, they are extremely strict. And they're a bit of a bane of my existence. And the, um, we also have Paul Clitheroe on our board, and uh, and I think one of our board members was also, I think was he chairman of the ASX, um, or maybe the ex-CEO. Um, but anyway, I think he had a long career at the ASX and all they talk about is liquidity. Um, so there's absolutely no way we're ever going to have any liquidity issues that um, entails an investor. But um, because we follow those rules anyway, it's, um, you know, it's actually all, it's impossible to have any liquidity issues. Um, so don't look at the um, transaction volume for the fund um, and imply that's got anything to do with the actual liquidity of the fund, which is extremely liquid, which you can see from the holdings yeah. anyway. And that's the other point is that with the three uh, intelligent investor funds that we've got, they all trade on the ASX, as you, you've mentioned, under the various ticker codes. Um, and if you do decide uh, to you know, buy them through your share broker, you can actually see on the uh, deal ticket that there's usually 100,000 on the buy side, 100,000 units uh, and 100,000 on the sell side. So that's our liquidity provider um, at work providing liquidity for the the market there. Um, the other thing too is say if you're someone who already holds units in this particular uh, fund, the ethical share fund, you can take part in this offer. And what happens is if you go to the offer page, which I'll post another link for you, and if you click uh, apply now, it'll give you the option to enter your HIN number and that's the holder identification number. And that's you get that from your share broker. So if you've got a Comsec account, a NAB trade, you'll have a uh, HIN number that starts with the letter X. If you type that in, uh, we can send these units uh, straight to your share trading account. And I'll post this uh, offer page for you as well. We've got a few questions. I'll just see if I can round a few more up. Um, obviously, the other thing is too, on that offer page I posted, this offer closes Friday the 28th of October, 5 p.m. Sydney Melbourne time. So that's the daylight savings time. Um, if you do apply, 
don't leave it to the last minute because there's a lot of times we see when people um, sending funds but they don't make it to us in time or they have limits uh, imposed by their banks on how much they can send at once. The minimum investment amount as shown on the uh, offer page there is $2,000. We don't know what the issue price will be uh, until the close of market on that Friday the 28th. It'll be the closing net asset value which is uh, what we'll give to you in the form of uh, units. So. Um, that's something that, you know, if everything continues as it is, it might be close to what it's trading at. And you can see the current net asset value unit price on the product page, uh, which I posted before. Is there other slides you want to cover off as well, Nathan? No, that's it for me, Tom. I, I just say in summary that, um, you know, downturns don't happen very often, especially in a world of Frankenstein monetary policies and governments and central banks bailing out everyone out at the first sign of any problems. So I'm, I'm really excited about the year ahead. I really can't wait. <laughs> I just, I'm just really looking forward to getting all the funds fully invested um, in some great opportunities to really set the, the funds up for the next five to 10 years. And hopefully it will require very minimal uh, input from me over that period if we pick the right stocks uh, over the next year and and we already know what they are and I've already started building them up and you're seeing those changes coming through in the portfolio now. I, I have no idea what the market's going to do. Uh, I'm not sitting here waiting for a GFC and I don't think anybody should. It's just um, the main issue is just really profit margins at, at the moment as interest rates go up and inflation through start, higher staff costs and things like that start to uh, impact profit expectations. But I really want to be here in a year's time just telling you how excited I am about the portfolio and it's already got some great stuff in it. It's just about filling out that sort of last 30% um, and maybe it's just worth saying to, um, you know, for people who put money in, you actually get the portfolio as it is. It's not like the, the cash just goes in and all of a sudden we've got 50% cash in the fund instead of 30. It, it gets invested how the fund is and um, even if the market sort of goes through these um, little bear market rallies on the way to something lower, uh, I think the funds are going to be just do just great and the performance of the actual stocks and the underlying businesses has been really good. So um, there's absolutely no stress at the moment. It's probably the safest portfolio I've ever managed. Uh, really excited about the next year and just want to thank everyone who supported this fund and our other funds. Um, it's been a great start to life. Um, but in investing, it's always about what have you done for me lately? And uh, I really want to be excited about the stocks we own in 12 months and, and hopefully um, keeping that outperforming going and um, you know, as I tell people like where our PDF says that we're aiming for 2% outperformance but I think if we really do our job right over the next year and we get the opportunities that I'm hoping for you know I really hope something 2 to 4% is more of what we can achieve but um, you know I think what's almost counterintuitive is it depends how cheap the market gets the cheaper the market gets um, you know if the market falls 10% then there'll be a whole bunch of other stocks that fall 20 to 30% and they're the ones that we want to be buying and that's how you get the, the big outperformance. So um, if you're a long-term value investor and you support our funds, um, please invest with us and cheer for lower prices because the, the short-term pain is what gives us the long-term gain. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nathan. And also thank you very much for attending the live webinar uh, and those who couldn't make it. Thanks for submitting questions uh, both in the webinar and also beforehand. You can contact us um, there's even a, a live chat on the website that pops up. You may have even seen the, um, the, the bot invite you to the webinar. So hopefully that wasn't uh, too annoying for you. Um, but there's also the Help Centre. And I've just posted a link uh, in the, the chat for this webinar to the Help Centre uh, because it does cover off a lot of the questions that we get asked uh, quite frequently. Questions like, um, you know, what can I, where can I see what's in the fund? Um, you know, how long, uh, has it been trading for? Uh, is it open-ended? Um, questions like that. But, you know, if you can't find an answer to the question, uh, definitely you can always reach out to us via email and you can email invest at investsmart.com.au or even invest at intelligentinvestor.com.au. But we'll get this webinar up on the website and we'll also try and get a few more answers to questions, uh, particularly around the ethical screening that I've got here on the, the side that I can see. Uh, so we'll try and cover that off. But uh, Nathan, thanks again. And uh, we'll Thank see you, you all next time. Uh, with this offer closing 5 p.m. 
daylight savings time, Melbourne, Sydney time on the 28th of October, a Friday. Thank you.